Staying Alive UK. Share your story. Hi, Alison. Thanks for coming on the podcast with me. Really great to see you. And uh, yeah, we met uh, because I attended a course, which I think I have mentioned to you was one of the best courses I've attended like online, literally in years. And uh, it's helped me a huge amount. So as a consequence, we got chatting and I invited for you to come on the podcast. So thanks for coming. Oh, no, it's an absolute pleasure. And it's lovely to get such awesome feedback because um, we no, aim really to do the best it. we I, can. I, I really mean it because I am super critical. You don't know me, but I'm I'm super critical when it comes to people presenting or running events. I don't know. It's like I always want to get the best out of it. And when, when I'm disappointed, I I'm a Dutchman, you see. So I, I kind of speak my mind. I don't have any filter. Well, I do, but I hold I don't hold back. So when somebody does something good, I also want to share it. So anyway, I highly recommend you as a you were a brilliant MC. Well, all the people that presented were also fantastic. OK, but today is about you and it's about your story. So what I'd like for you to do, if you can start with telling us uh, where it all began. So where were you born? Where did you go to school, education? Have you moved around the country or the world? Just tell us everything. <laughs> <laughs> Gosh, how long have we got? Um, uh, well, I was born in South East London, Guy's Hospital, and we lived in Dulwich in South East London. And um, something I've just been exploring recently, I was actually born really short sighted, but nobody knew when I was a child. So my parents would be like, we'd go to the park and my mom would go, look at the lovely ducks. And I'd be sort of looking around and <laughs> kind of where, and they just thought I was really stupid. And they right. had this really stupid fast child. Um, and then I went to, to like a, a preschool uh, nursery thing. And, um, and there was obviously a little point in the day where they kind of, the teachers had had enough and they plonked us all down in front of the television and everyone wanted to sit on the sofa, which was at the back. And I went and sat right in front of the television with about a foot to spare. And they went, mm, Mrs. Grade, we think your daughter might need spectacles. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I think really the world switched on there at that point. And it was a very different experience for both my parents and for me. I can um, imagine, yeah. So yes, and I've been I've been considering having my eyes done recently, which is quite complicated because I have a really strong prescription and realised that actually I kind of don't really mind and it's not going to fix it. So, no. but that's an aside. Um. Yeah. So so yeah. So yeah. The sort of world switched on when I got glasses and I went to school and um yeah, just schools in southeast London. We did move around a bit. My parents split up when I was about eight, and so we lived with my mom. And so I had this kind of weird, weird existence because my dad was working in film and TV. You know, he's Michael Grade, so he's run the BBC, he's run ITV, he's done all of these different, you know, he's run Channel 4, he's in the House of Lords now, so he was very high profile. And um, he did really helpful things when I was a teenager at school, like cancel Doctor Who and cancel Dallas and have a spitting image puppet. So I had this yes. weird existence whereby I was living with my mom. She was a single mom and my brother and, you know, my dad at, for part of the time he was in L.A. and then he came back here. Um, but so I had the sort of famous father, but quite distant. So, you know, it was an interesting, you know, we're very, mm. we're all very close now. And, you know, we, 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 we all have really strong relationships, but it was, it was kind of weird as a teenager to have sure. these very, very public things going on. And then, but also feeling quite disconnected from them. Yeah. So, wow. so yes, that was yeah. me. And I, I think one of my most influential things that I've done in my entire career happened in my teenage years, which was that we were in school and um, my father had bought Neighbours to show on the BBC and um, he'd put it on at half past nine and at half past one as a sort of filler, you know, stay at home parents, unemployed, all of that. You know, that, it was quite early stages of daytime TV. Um, yes. And us kids had discovered that actually you could switch the computer monitors over at school and turn them into tellies. And we'd all started <laughs> watching Neighbours in the lunch break. So I'd gone and told him that we were all watching Neighbours. And he sort of went, oh, 
there's an interesting audience here that I'm missing. I'm going to put it on at 1.30 and 5.30, which is where it stayed for many, many years. And that's yes. when Neighbours really took off. And he, he, he to, to his credit, he gave me the credit for... Um, for doing that and and that's been one of those long-running stories um over the years I love that, it. You know, um uh, even Dermot O'Leary was talking about it on the show recently when he had Kylie on so yeah um, <laughs> so so a crazy kind of confused exciting childhood of you know different experiences in different worlds with different people but but yeah, yeah, ultimately, I I was good at school. I did maths, physics and chemistry. I was very sciencey, got into Cambridge to be natural science, to, to read natural sciences, decided to go down a sort of social science route. So did that and ended up graduating in, um, uh, what was it? Uh, what was it? Was a, it was a kind of precursor to the MBA. It was a sort of... Um, uh, yeah, it was an undergraduate level MBA type thing from mm. there and just went, yeah. you know, I'm going to try and work in telly because right. I quite fancy it and it looks good fun and I can always get a proper job later so I can give it a go. Yes. yes. I, I just didn't like the look of the sort of, you know, the big, um, the big hall full of all these really corporate companies. I stuck my head in and went, oh, that's not for me. And no. kind of ran away with the circus and didn't really, haven't really looked back. <laughs> I think that was probably a wise choice. Yes, <laughs> fantastic. So, what was your first job then? What 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 did you do? So yeah, my first job was in my was uh, well, my first job in telly, or my very first job job that I got paid to do. Which one do you want? Yeah, first job that you got paid to do as well, please. Okay, <laughs> first job I got paid to do was um. I, after my O-levels, I got a summer job and I got a placement in a, a charity. It was summer of 1988 and it was a cancer charity called Search 88 and they were sort of an umbrella fundraising charity and I was helping them. I was just like the intern and I got, I got paid for, you know, I got paid a little bit and I was helping them promote and they did a whole big day called One Day for Life where they wanted everyone to take a photograph on a certain day and it all became a book and there was lots of marketing around that. So that was my first job and it gave me my taste of a kind of production and office environment that I really, yeah. I really enjoyed. Great. And then the telly job. So the telly job, um, you know, I, I've said, you know, my, my, my dad worked in telly. So, you know, I had, you know, the networks were there. The opportunities to be introduced to people were very much there. But I had to work so, so hard to prove myself. So it wasn't very difficult to find, you know, who, who, who am I to talk to, who to write to. But when I did get work, I was always having to really go go above and beyond so three mm. months into a job i was absolutely like if i you know i worked really hard and people were really happy but at the beginning people were really skeptical oh she's only here because so yes. but i think that's really enhanced my work ethic to really do things really well um right. so my first job came about because i you know i'd had some i had some names of people to write to i wrote to them put my letters in the post said i'll follow up followed up called up and uh, someone said to me, I was looking for runners jobs. And they said, oh, well, no, we've got a runner now. There might be one in six months time. So I was like, well, can I come in and meet you anyway, in case there's something going? And they was, you know, for, for in six months time thinking, I'm never going to stick around for six months, but at least I get mm. to meet them. So I went yeah. in and met this company, you know, had a, had a good chat. And then she was impressed with me. And then she was out um, at a social thing that evening with another producer who was crewing up for a show. And he said, oh, we need a production assistant. She said, oh, I met someone today. And literally I got the phone call saying, hey, I'm going to, hey, I was out with so-and-so last night. I just, she passed me your details. You know, it's before GDPR. So anyone could give anyone anyone's phone number. And, yes. and I went in to meet them and I got that role on a feature film, which was um, The Mystery of Edwin Drood, which is Charles Dickens' last unfinished novel, which was helpfully finished by the director. Um, so <laughs> it, it, it was a deferred payment feature film. So we were on expenses only. But then that, what was interesting was obviously the networks all started there because I had that one person who I'd met who'd recommended me to Keith who was the producer did that job got the expenses it was the summer you know we were put up in hotels we were fed you know it, it was it was a great first job but then 
the guys who were composing the music then hired me to be their office assistant because they needed someone in the office and they were trying to get some productions away. So I was working with them. And then they yeah. sub like half of their office to an animation company who then invited, asked me to go work with them as a production coordinator because they had three animation productions going. So I got to work with them. And then yes. I realized that I was wanted to work on some slightly different stuff. So I then went, went, okay, who do I need to talk to? Who's in my networks now? Who can I talk to? And then I got myself into Zenith, which was an amazing production company. We did Blues and Twos, which was fly on the wall. Emergency services, one of the fast ones. I mean, it would have been so much easier today with like our iPhones, but we had like tape machines this big being stapled into police cars and crazy cameras and stuff. But yeah, so it just kind of all built from that, you know, that yes. those first few letters that I sent out and just building those good relationships. Yeah, sad. I mean, it sounds very much like you used the network. Once you got in, you used the network that you created and the people that you met to continue the process of finding work. Sounds incredible, yeah. Yeah, and but you know, it's still the same way in telly these days. You know, it's all you know. We all know more people than we think we know because yes, you know, I and you know, um, there's so many people in our networks, our friends, our family, all of these different people, and they might not be able to hire us directly. But if we sat down with everybody and said, okay, who are the two people in your network that might be able to help me? I bet they could come up with two who might directly hire you for work. So if you kind of go through that process, you suddenly yes. find that actually you've suddenly got a list of 200 people that you need to, you could write to. And, yeah. and it's when you're starting out, that includes like your lecturers, your colleagues, you know, people you've worked with, your neighbors, you don't know who knows who. Yeah. Um, so yeah. i mean i've got work through all sorts of different pathways literally my neighbor over the road got me into doing lecturing in a university because she goes to the theater with someone who was at a university and it's not like you know it's it's all those different places but it's who's at one step removed that's the interesting bit who can you introduce me to that's when it gets yes. exciting yeah 100 percent. yeah really really do concur with that fantastic okay so um so what happened next? Whereabouts were you? I, I, I've, I can't, I haven't got a time scale. So how long were you in telly before, you know, how many different roles did you do? Or how many different companies did you work for? So I worked for quite a few different companies. Um, so yeah, in terms of time scale, I'll, we're, we're, we're in the early 90s here. So I graduated in 92. And I think I got the job in Zenith in about 94. Or 95 94 93 maybe i'm losing track myself and i work <laughs> i was there i was at zenith for a couple of years and they ivan um who was the exec producer you know sadly he's passed away but he was one of my great mentors and he was really helpful because he was the person who just said to me you know my door's always open you know if something goes wrong come and tell me if you try and cover it up it's just going to make it worse so and that's mm. something i've really lived by on in terms of how I operate and work with bosses, but also how I like to work with my teams as well. So, yeah. you know, I worked at Zenith for a couple of years and I really was supported and trained and really became, that's when I became a production manager from really being a sort of low level coordinator. I got to, to be production manager on some peak time ITV series, which was just amazing. And, yeah. you know, um, the other shows that were coming out of Zenith at the time were really exciting because I was in the London office. They had a whole drama unit so they were doing things like Hamish Macbeth they were doing some really exciting stuff they were doing famous five uh, a period a 50s period kids thing but up in Newcastle where the head office was they were doing Biker Grove which is where Ant and Dec started out so then I got involved yes. in like the first series of the Ant and Dec show which was on children's BBC and, and right. it was crazy fun so just got a taste of those entertainment shows and really really liked those um i then wanted to step up and and go a bit more freelance i felt that i was doing really well in the staff role at, at zenith but my experience and my pay were a bit out of kilter as is the way with staff jobs you know someone invests yes. in you for the longer time your credit goes up but your pay doesn't i decided it was time to get the pay up so i went out into the marketplace got um had a, had a short contract track with atlantic productions who were doing some stuff around the history of buckingham palace windsor castle restoration of windsor castle we were shooting on film which was amazing it's the only mm. time i've shot on film we were doing some pre-development work and it was just at the time when princess diana went on panorama and the whole project got shut down whoa 
Um, and we'd filmed in Buckingham Palace and we'd filmed on Win at Windsor Castle in November in the freezing cold because it was a building site because of the fire and stuff like that. Yes. So, yes. so, so that was uh, a really short contract. But through that, um, I connected with the team at Thames and there was a big development team put together because Channel 5 was just about to launch and Thames was part of that group and they were bidding yeah. in for loads of projects. So I was working with the development team as the production manager, developing, you know, doing all the budgets for all the ideas that they were creating. And then that got me into the bigger entertainment shows at Thames. So I started working with Des O'Connor, Des O'Connor Tonight, Take Your Pick, did those kind of shows, did some archive shows, Heroes of Comedy, um, were yeah, just lots and lots of the shiny floor entertainment stuff, which is just great fun. And just it was such a buzz being based at Teddington Studios. Um, and just walking into the office every, you know, walking into my little tiny space in a, you know, grotty 70s office, but I got to walk through the studios and the scene dock and there was things happening and there were people in the canteen and, you know, that was there were stars sitting there. It was just it was just a fun place and a really good vibe. So <laughs> I just love those entertainment shows and being in that environment was great fun. And it was, it was yeah. just a lovely place to be. And then where did I go from? Yeah. Then I went up to the, the, the central London office where they're at, where, where, where Fremantle Thames is at now and opposite the BFI and Stephen street. And oh, then I had some fun. I went to planet 24 and did a big show for them. They, we weren't, I wasn't on the big breakfast, but I was on a show based in the same building it was nothing but the truth um so i did that series and then i got a, her first head of production role at uden associates run by patrick uden who's brilliant and they had a whole range of really nice factual entertainment shows so i was across that whole raft of shows and great teams of people and we did some we did some really exciting shows in that um, there was a whole big thing around masthead television, which is where you could use the name of a magazine or a newspaper and make a TV show around it. And, and the rules had changed. And we worked with Dazed and Confused magazine. So Jefferson and Rankin, who run that. And we did Dazed and Confused TV, which was crazy. And we just we got up to all sorts of crazy secret filming and had all these fantastic, but really avant-garde artists making short films. And it, it was, it was challenging, but I love those quirky, challenging things that are just yeah. out of the box. I was, I'm always a first series merchant when it comes to TV. I like working out how you do it. Once I've worked out how you do it, give someone else series too. Here's, here's the rule book. <laughs> I like to start it all off. Oh, brilliant. Sounds incredible. Okay, so what, what, where are we now in the... Where are we now? Crikey, we are, yeah, so I did, I did, I did those, um, I did those, and then I went to some guys who I knew from, from, well, it was Pearson's then, Thames, Talkback, whatever, whatever you want to call it, they'd set up their own production company, they'd have got a commission from Channel 5 to remake It's a Knockout. Um, oh, yes. So I went in and I was head of production with them and I went in and did that and did a couple of seasons of that as head of production, which was completely bonkers and outside <laughs> broadcasts all around the country, yes. uh, you know, crazy penguin costumes and everything else. Um, and at that point, uh, I, it was crazy. It was mad. But I was starting to a bit fall out of love with production because I'd been right. a production manager for quite a while. And I sort of felt that, you know, I was asked questions and I was kind of like, well, no, that's really not going to work on that budget. And people go, well, could you just try? And you just kind of know it's not going to work. And I wasn't being listened to and I wanted to move on to bigger and better things. So I was like, okay, mm. so what do I do with my career? And I took some time to think about it. And I realized that actually what I wanted to do was move up to a more strategic level. So not be down, in, not be in the heart of production, but move up to a more strategic business side of things. And the way I was going to do that was actually yeah. go to INSEAD and get an MBA. So we're now right. sort of 2000, 2001, and I went to INSEAD. So I knew that I needed to go away for a year and, and do it and just be, have my head down. I knew that I wouldn't have the discipline to do like part work, part MBA and social life because there were only... That, that wasn't a thing that split into three for me. Yes. It yeah. could only split into two. And if I was trying to do work, MBA and social life, it was just going to be work and social life. And I wouldn't do the MBA bit. So I was like, no, I need to put the work aside. So I went to INSEAD because they did it for a year. And I met some amazing people there and just learned so much about the toolkits and the frameworks too. 
be a leader, be a manager, run a company and be an entrepreneur. And I think it's when I came out of INSEAD that I was, I got a really great job. I went back to Fremantle, but I was upstairs. I was in the strategy team. I was working with the CEO, you know, um, there was some really exciting people there. Alex Mayholm was in that team. She's now chief executive channel four. So, you know, really, really dynamic place to be. But at yes. the same time, it just didn't feel like me. I, I'm not a big company person. So right. that was when I just went, actually, I need to do something different. I'm going to start my own company. And over the summer break with NCAD, I'd got a motorbike license and I'd really loved learning how to ride a motorbike. And but I was really frustrated by the process. I loved the motorbike, but I was really frustrated by the process. So I was okay, okay. And I decided that I wanted to run a motorbike training school for women so that women could be in a safe environment wow. to learn to ride a motorbike. So I quit the job at um, Fremantle and went and set up my motorbike training school called Girls Angels. Oh, my God. That's <laughs> amazing. <laughs> but uh, when when did you fall in love with motorbikes or was that something you'd, you'd always fancied when you were younger or... No, not at all. I, I was it was born out of practicalities because I was I was I was looking at where I was going to work after INSEAD and realized that my networks really were in London. My knowledge was of the UK market. You know, if I wanted to get a senior level job, that's where I was going to be. And um, I had a house in Fulham that I'd rented out in southwest London. So I was a little bit out, not, not that far out of town, but enough that I kind of hated the tube. And I was mm. like, I'd got away from the tube for a year and I didn't want to go back to it. So I was like, okay, I can yeah. either move into the city centre and like live in central London because, you know, I didn't have to worry about kids, schools, husbands or anything like that. Or mm. I could get a motorbike licence and then going to work would be fun. So I thought, well, why don't I get the motorbike licence? Because that's yeah. much easier than trying to sell right. my house and buy another one. Um, and of course, I just fell in love with riding the bike at that point. So it was really just a kind of cheeky, practical way of not going on the tube. <clears throat> yeah and getting through the traffic basically yeah yeah i'm being too lazy being... to ride a bicycle <laughs> yes i think the whole uk is actually i'm saying this as a dutchman again a reference to the netherlands but um oh my god okay so girls angels you said yes <laughs> so how i mean having never done something like that before what made you think you were suited and suitable to be able to do that well, no I was fear a, no no fear i was a freshly minted mba i was ready to conquer the world and um, Brilliant. i was armed with the tools and the toolkit and i just sat down and worked it out and i i found some mentors and some people to help me you know mm. one of my great friends i was like desperate to do it she just sat down with me with a big sheet of paper and said right what do we need to do and we just plotted it out into a to-do list because i got stuck so i did that i had another hr friend who helped me with recruitment you know lots of different people in my networks kind of yeah. supporting me and helping me and you know we ran it for about three years and i sold it in a trade sale and it just grew to a point where it was a really difficult business to manage and it was so different to film and tv because yeah. in film and tv i'm working generally monday to friday it's not nine to five yes there's night shoots yes there's weekend shoots but generally it's an office type of role and yes. that's when most of the activity happens so that that you know i was i was in that kind of in that sort of zone and, and also when you're working in film and tv most people are you know are there because they have great skills, they've got specialist knowledge, they want to be there, they love working there. And suddenly mm. here I was running a business that was my business and everything happened at the weekends in terms of running the show because that's when all the training was. But everyone wanted to book in during the week because that's when they were in the office and wanted to make the booking. So we had the seven day a week thing and I was, yes. had motorbike, uh, I had instructors. Now I hadn't had my license long enough to be an instructor. So I had a huge handicap there. And the instructors, yes. a lot of them had been couriers, dispatch riders in London who got had enough of that. Um, mm. valued their lives too much but you know quite frankly you know they weren't the same as the tv people that i've managed you know if they just no. had a hangover they just went you know what can't come in today and uh. so that whole sort of management of a really different kind of workplace culture was really was a real eye-opener because it was so yeah. different in in film and tv um yeah. and it was challenging um and i realized that i liked doing things that actually gave me the weekends off when i sold it and have strategically 
focused on doing things in in that way because it just I found it really difficult because I couldn't switch off during the week but then I had to be on at the weekends and so there just wasn't that space so no that, no. that was hard well I mean you you obviously grew it significantly sufficiently to be able to sell it so which is which is brilliant oh wow yeah oh, well that I mean <laughs> I didn't expect that one at all <laughs> But I'm, I'm glad you put it in because it's a really lovely diversion. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's it's about, you know, doing what you love doing, yeah. I guess. And and I kind of bring all of this up because if you then go, so, OK, so that takes me to like 2004 and I'm just meeting my husband. And, you know, I just I, at that point, I just went back to film and TV and um, yes. I moved out of London. Sean was based in the East Midlands. I was work in Birmingham. So got some work in Birmingham, just kind of went and said, you know, I'm going to take my foot off the gas. I'm going to go back to kind of production -y type thing um, just just to, you know, enjoy it and know i can do it quite easily you know i wanted to earn some money i don't want to sell my ass so i did mm. that and it and then you know started to have a family and it was really at that point that all the bits of my career started to join up because what does a yes. production manager do they take somebody's idea they turn it into a budget and a schedule and they make it happen and yeah. and that's what i do now a lot of is helping people transform their ideas into reality so the work mm. that i've done since i've had kids has all been around that and those building blocks you can see in the productions that i've pulled together you give me a proposal i come up with the budget the schedule i then make it happen you know yes. i've been to INSEAD, i've run my own company i've done that for myself and now i do workshops with creative entrepreneurs and freelancers and mentoring and with the book as well it's all in that same space it's helping people take their ideas and turn them into a reality so yeah. so that's really been the journey of you know the last 12 14 years is different clients in different ways and building that up and it's it's still all about spotting opportunities oh hmm. what's going on there oh you've got a problem there how can, am i the right person to solve that problem so yeah. it's so those same skills as when i was starting out talking to people, engaging, finding out what's going on. Yeah, yeah. Oh, brilliant. And and so when you got married, you had your children, so you obviously had some time out then, which was some time for reflection, I guess, as well. Um, so when you were ready to get back to work after that, did you go in, did you then decide to set up your own company straight away or what? how did that come about? Yeah. So, so no, it was an interesting time. Um, I, I was employed by by a company when 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 I went on maternity leave the first time, and then the circumstances of the company changed, and there wasn't a role for me to go back to, and that was quite hard to sort of think about. Okay, so there wasn't that role, and it also meant that there weren't any other really suitable or similar roles locally so i then started thinking well actually what do i want my quality of life to be you know yeah. i could get a role like that in london but actually would i ever see the kid and um, what would i do or what work could i get and that was that was an interesting journey of exploration to think actually you know what what are those um where do i add value what do i do because i hadn't done things like lecture to university students and things like things like that but actually that's what came out of those conversations with uh, mm. friends colleagues and i and i kind of had tea cups of tea with all sorts of people and started to work out and just tried out a few different things and really yeah. found that actually what i liked doing was sharing my knowledge inspiring people helping them take their journey to the next stage and right. that's what's really evolved over you know the last 10 years okay brilliant so then then of course when you decided to do that to kind of go it alone what how did you find clients i mean did you know i mean what was the proposal you know what like i am alison great i do this now <laughs> hire me <laughs> yeah yeah it was quite it was quite gentle at the beginning and um i had a couple of people who are uh, you'd i'd call them my sponsors now people who are you know championing me and giving me opportunities so initially it's you know talk about mm. production management talk about being an entrepreneur this mm. that and the other and then that got me involved in well actually you know delivering marketing workshops mentoring creative entrepreneurs and and it just it grew it grew slowly and, and i wasn't yes. looking to do too much and no i had a network of uh 
friends who I'd work with, you know, there was a group of us that were all in a similar boat that had had kids at roughly the same time. So we did some collaborations. We right. tried a few things out. Some things didn't work and whatever. We yeah. just moved on. And and then yeah. the, we did, I did a collaboration with somebody. We were trying to run some, you know, filmmaking after school clubs. Um, those didn't get off the ground, but then we, we enjoyed working together. So we found another opportunity and we did that. So different things evolved and different clients and I took opportunities to get involved in things and very much you know it you know we're, we're well pre-pandemic here so you know everything needed to be local so as much as anything I was looking to find places I could add value locally so in a way yes. I was probably spreading out some offering more different skills than maybe I do now because I can reach so many more people without traveling that I can mm. be more focused in my message now yeah yeah Okay. Oh, sounds it sounds a really great journey so far. Okay. <laughs> so what happened next? And and obviously I'd love to know how the book came about too. So maybe kind of lead us into that gently. Yeah. So, you know, I think lots of different bits of freelancing work and just knowing that what I enjoyed was the workshops with the entrepreneurs, with the freelancers yes. and the mentoring particularly. I love sitting down with people one on one and just talking it through. So working and there's lots of those kind of business support programs that go through university. So got involved in that, got the opportunity to get trained as a Nesta creative enterprise trainer, which opened up some international training with the British yes. Council. So Moscow, Macedonia, Alexandria, all sorts of exciting places, mm. um, which was amazing. And then. I'd done a lot of work with Birmingham City University locally, and I was asked to do a research project about what the art design and media faculty were doing on employability. And right. so I got to meet all the different heads of schools and uh, to, to talk to them about this employability research project. And I kept coming away from these meetings with, with you know, the information I needed for the report, but these extra reflections on, you know, You've got a place that the students go to if they want to get a job. You've mm. got a place if the students can go to if they want to start a business because I'm involved in that bit. But those freelancers, freelancers don't talk the language of, you know, minimum viable products, building a team, investors, you know, yes. how to sell on Etsy, all of that kind of stuff. They're talking about trading, you know, selling their services, trading time for money. And and so um, you know, and the career service doesn't get freelancing and the enterprise bits doesn't get freelancing. So it's sort of a, thinking, well, what happens to these students? Because actually they get left to talk to the lecturers who are salaried employees. So they're not always going to understand about no. freelancing. And Creative Industries Federation have come out with a report that says something like 47 percent of the work in creative industries is self-employed, is freelance. So you're going, wow, hang on. So yeah. literally 50 percent of your students don't get that kind of support. So I was like, oh, that's a bit strange because I've been a freelancer all my career. I know what it's all about. I've yeah. hired loads of freelancers. I've done it in all sorts of different ways. And I was like, well, is there a book on it? I looked on Amazon, couldn't see anything that I'd want to read. So I went, no, I'm going to set myself a challenge of writing this book. So brilliant. So I did. And then I had to find a publisher <laughs> and that was another <laughs> journey. And, and, you know, it's just been a whole big journey, but it's been super exciting. And, um, you know, I've had some amazing feedback from people where it's just like, you know, it's about those practical steps. It's about uh, empowering people and inspiring them to take that next journey. And I think, you know, you know, you very kindly said nice things about me at the start of this. And I think that that's kind of the energy that I bring into the room and it comes across in the book. It's just, you can do this. Let's think about it. How are we going to take this yeah. forwards? And, and so how long did it take you to write it? It took probably about a year and a half, if I'm realistic from, that's not you bad know, at all. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I, you know, I picked it up and put it down and picked up and put it down just depending on what what work I had had yes. on. Um, yes. And um, so well, exactly so, yeah. whilst you're doing your own freelancing work as well, you've got to find time and prioritize that as well, which is sometimes quite tough. I mean, you know, they say every everyone has a book inside of them somewhere, you know, because we all have a story to tell or we want to help people mm. in some way. And I guess it's, it's, it is a challenge when you kind of go, right, I'm going to write a book now. Okay. What am I going to, I know I want what I want to write about, but you know, I've got to find time in the schedule to be able to do it mm. as well. 
Yeah, and it and you know finding the time, but also being focused was really hard at the beginning because I'm so used to that quite. You know, production management is very operational work. You get an email, you sort it out, you send it on, you make a phone call, you just do things. Whereas writing, you kind of need to park all of that and just yes. quieten down all of that. So I was literally turning off my email programs, putting my phone on silent, turning it upside down and just going, right, no, I've got to do some writing here. And, you know, really that first 20, 25 minutes of sitting there was really hard. And I, I yeah. actually used to go to a co-working space just because I couldn't go, oh, I could put some washing on. Oh, I could do that. You know, so I really had nothing else to do. And I had a, I had a big flip chart paper where I'd sort of divided it into like four sections that I was going to cover in the book. It, it changed for publication. And I was sitting there with this big flip chart paper and I was tapping away. And I'd been at this co-working place for about three weeks on and off. And I said, I had, you know, every time I set up in the same way with my computer, my phone on the side, and you know, yeah. this big piece of paper. And eventually, the guy who is lovely there, Patrick, says to me, Alice, are you still working on that? You know, haven't you finished that yet? I was like, it's a book. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Don't you know anything, for God's sake? It's not going to it's be like, done in three like, weeks. Hang on, you're still, you've got this one piece of paper here, and you're still <laughs> yes. writing your slides or whatever for that. Like, yeah, that's book. right. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I love it. Yeah. It's, it's, it, it is, I, I mean, I know it is challenging to do things like that. I, I, you know, I've tried to, well, I have done like e-learning stuff in the past and it, it just takes a lot of time and energy, you know, to focus on something. And not only that, if you haven't written a book before, you're also learning as well at the same time, you know, Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, brilliant. I applaud you. So, so when you say you had to then find a publisher, mm. you, you didn't have somebody or you didn't, you weren't going to self publish? Well, I, I looked at both options. I, I didn't, I, I'd set myself the challenge of writing the book. But I didn't see any point for me to go and look for publishers before I'd written it because I didn't know if I could write it. I didn't know if it'd be any good. So I wasn't mm. prepared. I didn't see the point of getting tied into a book deal if I didn't think I could write a book kind of thing. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, and I wasn't in a hurry. So, no. Um, so I did, I did that. Um, and I'm just, sorry, the doorbell's just gone. Are we allowed to edit this? Yeah. I'll, I'll pause. It's fine. Okay. Cool. So, yeah. So I was looking at, um, you know what what whether i was going to publish it publish it myself or or go to a publisher but i i wanted to get the manuscript in the right shape first to, to even know if there was a market for it so yes. i got the manuscript together and it seemed a sensible and prudent approach to look for a uh a, a traditional publisher before making the decision to self-publish for me right um i'd written the book with a view to getting my message out there and the brand and the credibility that would come with a traditional publisher was a key part of what I was looking for. It wasn't essential, but I felt that yes, you get lower royalties, but you get a better brand, you get more exposure, you get more marketing behind you. And actually, you know, yes. you, you get, you get, there's a certain different level that you've had a commission and it's been published and and you get all of their expertise and the copy editing and all of that so so i felt that that was certainly the way i wanted to try and i wasn't prepared to self-publish without giving that a proper shot so mm, but i mm. didn't really know much about publishing so i then started like okay google tell me some names of publishers you know obviously i'd heard of some you know it's yes. not very difficult to have heard of penguin and and, and that kind of thing but at the same time it's like well you know you look at penguin random house and there's like however many different imprints which imprint did i need to which imprint was interesting you know which what who's publishing what books who's publishing things in that space who's not publishing in that space at all that could be you know what where are the opportunities and how how do i pitch to them so i started doing a lot of research around that 
there were some really great uh, smaller publishers that I came up came across who would take unsolicited proposals on it. There was one that even had a really fantastic template of how to write your book proposal so they would actually read it. So I was yes. like, okay, great, book proposal. And then I was like, oh my God, that's quite a lot of work. So I ended up writing another 20 page document, not just about the book, mm. but about all the marketing and all of those opportunities. Because business books are all, you know, in the past and doing the speaking, the talking and all of that alongside, you know, the content. So, so yes. I wrote my p- proposal, having spent ages writing my manuscript and um, just started sending it off to people. So sent it off to those where I had email addresses, kept track of that. Um, and then once I'd done that, I was like, okay, so who do I know? I'm like, who, who do I know in publishing? Who do I know? It's like, oh yeah, I'm going to that drinks party with those friends from university and she's going to be there and she works in publishing, right? I'm going to chat to her. Um, yes. and, and literally nobbled my friend in a corner and said, right, I've, I, I know I don't need to do this, but I've, I, I've written a book and I want to talk to you and who do I, who, who, who can I send it to? <laughs> um, and, 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 and luckily she was uh, gracious and helpful and said, I will introduce you to, I know exactly who you should talk to. You should talk to uh, my colleague who used to work with me she's now at penguin heading up the business team and you need to speak to her and she actually gave me an introduction and i ended up with two offers um on my book one from the team at penguin that i got introduced to that way and one through a completely cold email where i had written in on spec and had a meeting and they so i got two offers from both routes but penguin was uh the most compelling offer and that they've been an absolute dream to work with but you know it was great i sent in my manuscript they 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 love it and they're like yeah we really like it but we want all the words in a different order so i had to restructure and reorder it but it's a much better book because of that yeah yeah oh wow it's it's a whole different world isn't it 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 just takes so much commitment i believe and energy to go down that route i mean yeah and also not to give up at any point you know i mean i've heard people say things like oh yeah i i wrote this book five years ago but i've done nothing with it or you know so brilliant brilliant okay so the book gets launched and and how long has it been out now oh it came out on the 5th of march 2020 so you know, we just snuck in the launch party um, and then the world shut down. Um, yeah. So it's been an interesting journey because I sort of, I know I'm an author, I've got copies of the book all over the place, but I haven't really seen it on the bookshelf that I'm just wandering past when I go to the bookstore because we've just been in these mad times. That's but, right. You know, but it's, you know, what what's, it's actually been a, a really busy time for me because there are so many freelancers who are out there looking to connect, looking to find their way forward. You know, this literature isn't really out there. It's amazing to see other books coming on stream. There's a, there's a couple of other authors who are writing in this space and that's really exciting to me. It's like, it's not, you know, how many business books are there in the marketplace? Mm. You know, there's thousands, hundreds of thousands. So, you know, if I've got two or three other people writing in that space, that, that, that validates the need for literature on this so you know that's really exciting and you know it's it's just been a time where you know i'm working in leeds i'm working in nottingham i'm working in london i'm working you know in plymouth i'm working in belgium in new york in australia i can work with anyone anywhere it's just zoom has transformed things for me in a way I couldn't have conceived when even at the point of publication of the book you know I was still talking about you know my roller banner behind me oh I'm going to events I need a roller banner you know I really need some books for people to sign I need people to be able to pay for them there and then with a card and I stuff all this in the real world stuff and then this is all happening on zoom and you know but it's been an amazing way to connect with people yeah yeah 100 percent and so even though so it's a it's a book that was kind of launched just before the pandemic and is now finding its way <laughs> through the pandemic into people's hands and and do is it providing you you know i mean you know opportunities to talk about it uh, oh, i mean obviously yeah. you've got an opportunity right here to talk about <laughs> it but any you know has that been really worthwhile for you 
Oh yeah, I mean it's it's been amazing. I, I I've just finished this week a five week series of two hour workshops with Leeds Beckett, who've been amazing working with their careers team and the creative students who are just graduating. You know, right. going through a real deep dive on the book and working with a whole range of universities like that. Working with community groups, um, doing lots of work. Obviously, we met through. You know, I sort of work broadly across creative industries, but I also do yes. a lot of deep dive work in film and TV. So we've done a a lot of work with screen skills on yes. employability so those freelancing skills but adding the wrap of well how do you get into film and tv how does it work what does it look like you know what's the point of a job for a day is that really going to help you get your career started or do you wait for a big long contract to come up how does that all work and so we've done lots of work around that and we've really excitingly just launched a a pro uh, a one day event called first steps into film and tv you know it's mm. all about switching on your potential because we know that film and tv recruits in such a weird way and if you don't understand what good looks like how it works how to sell yourself what people value when you're leaving you know education and trying to get in it's really difficult and mm. the, the 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 biggest you know the biggest frustration is that there's so many young people wanting to get into the industry, but equally the production companies can't find these people. And it's just like, they're just fishing in different ponds. So this event yes. is about trying to demystify that because if you're keen and hungry as a new entrant, you've got to make some steps towards finding where your customers are. Now I'm not saying yeah. the production companies can't do more, but actually if you really want to get that work, this is a day to show you how to get there. And, and we've got a fantastic lineup of people and it's 12 pounds for the day. So what more could you ask for? Brilliant. And what's the date of that event? It's the 24th of June. Right. Okay. And it's well, all so online and it's designed to be like, it's not like, oh, you've got to move to London kind of thing. You know, I'm based in Birmingham, as you know, and, you know, it's about you understanding what's going on around you and finding the right opportunity for you. Yeah. Yeah. Brilliant. Okay, that's, I mean, fantastic. Um, what, so what are the things that, that you're up to with the book or workshops or anything else that you want to share? Um, tell us about where people can find you, you know, when they search for you, anything else that we haven't covered? Cool. So yeah, I'm on LinkedIn and Twitter as at Alison Grade and I'm on uh, Instagram as at freelance Bible, which is great. Um, and I'm one of the clients that I love working with is the guardian. And I've got a masterclass coming up on the 5th of July, which I believe is live for booking now as well. So that's two and a half hours of me talking about how to be a great freelancer. So, you know, um, not all the stuff I do is, is open to everybody. And the guardian one is great because it's open and it's part of all of their masterclasses series. So, you know, that's great fun. Good, good, good. Well, I'll make sure to include all of those in the show notes. So yeah. sh should I have asked a question, anything else that we haven't covered that you would have liked to have shared, Alison? Oh, I think I've talked for way too long. It's been completely self-indulgent. So No, no, that's the whole purpose <laughs> of this. And, you know, you, it's been really, really inspiring, you know, and, you know, people that are listening to this that are thinking about starting a business or thinking about freelancing. I mean, this is particularly important with, you know, as we're starting to hopefully come out of this pandemic in a little, <laughs> little bit of a way um people need to look for work or do their own thing you know and i think lots of people have had time to reflect over the last 14 months or so and kind of go do i really want to go back to that corporate job or mm -hmm. am i going to do my own thing and to be able to find a resource like you and the knowledge and experience that you have will be invaluable to them so yeah i hope they 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 absorb all of your content and courses and and books and everything. So, yeah, fantastic. No, it's been it's been an absolute pleasure. I I can only see freelancing increasing and as, yes. as we come out of this as well. So I think more and more people are going to find that they need to be freelance for their careers. And you know, it's not always very comfortable coat to wear. So you know, my book really is about taking people on that journey. Yeah, fantastic. 
thank you so much, Alison, for your time and, and sharing your story today. I've really, really enjoyed listening to the, the magical mystery tour that has got <laughs> you here. And uh, hopefully one day we'll meet in Birmingham for a cup of coffee or a bite to eat. And, and uh, I'll look forward to that. Um, in the meantime, thanks for coming and uh, speak to you soon. Thanks so much for having me. It's lovely to see you. And I, yes, I'd love to have a coffee soon. All right. Bye for now. Bye. Bye. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please rate, subscribe and share at will. I'm always looking for more listeners and guests. So do get in touch, please. You can find me pretty easily by searching for Staying Alive UK. Thank you. Staying Alive UK. Share your story.